I've been assigned verses 3, 4, and 5, so let me read God's word for you, and before I do, let me pray. Father, we, we thank you for the scriptures. Holy men of old wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest, and all for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, uh, Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Well, as we've seen in the 12th chapter of Romans, it's a turning point in Paul's uh, epistle, much the same way that the fourth chapter of Ephesians is a turning point. Paul gives us the gospel, he gives us doctrine, and then he applies that doctrine. There is, first of all, what we might call uh, the indicative, uh, and now we're in the imperative. There's a gospel shape and there's a gospel pattern to Paul's letter to the Romans as there is uh, so definitively in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And here in verses 3 to 5, he brings up the matter of spiritual gifts. Now, this is one of several Um, chapters uh, in the New Testament in which Paul enumerates uh, spiritual gifts. You have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you have Ephesians chapter 4, and then Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4 has uh, a list uh, of gifts, and none of these uh, lists of gifts are exhaustive. Well, it'll be my colleagues tomorrow who will uh, elaborate and enumerate uh, what these gifts are here in Romans 12. But here in this, um, in these verses 3 to 5, he's giving us a fundamental principle as we approach the idea of spiritual giftedness, as we've just heard, we need to address the issue of humility. Whenever we're thinking about our giftedness, and there are certain Christians who like to talk about their giftedness and to tell you what their particular gift is. And the tendency in such circumstances is always pride and boasting. And it draws attention, it almost inevitably draws attention to yourself and how you are different from the person to whom you are speaking. Your self-achievement, how useful you are, how talented you are, how the church needs you, how blessed the church is to have you. Uh, you're not you're not 30 seconds into a discussion about your giftedness and you're in the area of pride and so paul says that we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think now there's a story some of you might know my great love for classical music And there's a story of 
uh, a young woman uh, who visits uh, a museum in Bonn in Germany. And uh, in this museum is um, Beethoven's piano. Uh, one of the great musicians of um, the Western world. And um, she asks the attendant and, 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 and passes over some dollars uh, and maybe a lot of dollars if she could play the piano just for a minute or two. And she, she sits down and uh, she plays um, the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And when she's done, she says, I guess all the great pianists want to play it. And the man says, well, on the contrary, Paderewski, the great Polish pianist, was here just a month ago. And I asked him if he would like to play it. And he says, I am unworthy to play Beethoven's piano. This particular section, and indeed the whole chapter, brings to our attention the need for humility when we think about ourselves in our self-assessment. Now, Romans, of course, is set in the Greco-Roman world, the Hellenistic world, uh, within the world of the ethical and moral teaching of Greek philosophy. And Greek philosophy tended to incite and encourage pride. Oh, Greeks, and, and if you're Greek, if you're Greek, we have a Mr. Halopoulos speaking tomorrow, so I need to be careful what I'm saying here, but <laughs> Greeks were people who knew things. Of all the peoples of the then known world, I mean, the Greeks knew stuff. And humility was a sign of weakness. And in a sense, Christianity brought something quite new into the world. The idea that humility was a virtue. It was totally foreign to the Hellenistic world. Well, you have it today. What is the philosophy that is around today? Well, be yourself. Trust yourself. Be confident about yourself. Assert yourself. Be who you are. And you notice that Paul begins with these words, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you. Here's a man, and, and this is the first idea that I want us to think about. That Paul's first thought as, he, as he's going to treat the issue of spiritual giftedness, uh, the various kinds of gifts and how those gifts can be used and utilized for the benefit of the church, he begins, as he begins to address this issue, he begins with the idea that he is a man who has tasted grace. of all the things that the Apostle Paul um, could have brought to the table. You want to know about spiritual gifts? Well, let me tell you, because I'm a man full of spiritual gifts. I'm an apostle. Imagine the kinds of things that Paul could have brought to the table. But Paul... Paul is a man above everything else who has tasted the power of the grace of God. Now, he has dealt with this majestically, of course, in this epistle to the Romans, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, by grace alone, apart from the works of the law. You remember what he said, where is boasting then? 
it is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Not have I gotten, but what I have received, grace has bestowed it, and I have believed. Boasting, excluded, pride I abase, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Well, that's Pauline theology. That's Pauline theology 101. Where do I start? I want to talk about gifts, spiritual gifts. Gifts endowed by the power and gifting of the Holy Spirit. Gifts for the edification of the church. But where does Paul begin? He begins by saying, I am a man who has tasted and received grace. He's talking, well, he's talking first of all about his own conversion. How he came to faith. Grace came to me. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the Christian church. You must understand that this man almost brought the early church to the very edge of extinction. He was within an inch of the church's life of snuffing it out entirely. He hated Christ. He regarded Christ as a blasphemer. That Christ's claim to be the Messiah was nothing short of blasphemy. And then on the Damascus Road, his complicity in the stoning of Stephen. He may not have lifted a stone himself, but they brought their garments and laid them at his feet. They did it at his bidding. He was responsible for it. Without, without his edict, Stephen would still be alive. Don't you think, as I often think, that hardly, hardly a night went by that as he lay down to sleep, he would, he would think of that incident, that he was responsible for the death of this young seraphic deacon preacher called Stephen. What an incredible gift Stephen was to the church. Read the seventh chapter of Acts and the astonishing sermon that uh, Stephen preaches, bringing together uh, almost the entirety of the Old Testament, narrating the purposes of God in redemption, culminating in the coming of Christ. And Paul was responsible for his death, for his execution. Grace came to me. Every night as he went to sleep, he would, he would think to himself, grace came to me. I, I, deserved, I deserved hell and damnation for what I did. But the risen Jesus appeared before me, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, he was persecuting Stephen. But he was persecuting Jesus, and grace came to him. He might have raised the matter of the fact that he was an apostle, the greatest apostle, superior to John and Peter and Jude and James. He says at the end of Romans in chapter 15 and verse 15, having written to them boldly, more boldly, because of the grace given me by God. He had written to them boldly because he was an apostle, because grace had been given to him. God had taken him from one realm and placed him in another. I think it filled him with amazement that God had chosen him, of all people, to be an apostle. Grace came to me. He could roll out his achievements. 
he could say to these Roman Christians, you want to talk about gifting? Well, I've written the epistle to the Romans. People are going to study it for the the rest of, of, of the existence of this world and beyond. People are going to say about it, even secular people are going to say about it, it's the greatest letter that has ever been written. There are hundreds, possibly thousands of commentaries on Romans, and still they're turning them out. My good friend Steve Lawson is about to publish part one of his, of his study on Romans, and it's almost a thousand pages. <laughs> Steve, if you're listening, you owe me, you, you owe me a dollar or two. Imagine the things that the Apostle Paul could have said. And instead, what does he say? For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to everyone among you, no distinction. There's no distinction between Paul and the Christians to whom he is speaking. There's no clergy, laity distinction that Paul is making here. He has certain gifts. He has massive gifts. What a preacher he must have been. Wouldn't you like to go to a a little place and you press a button and the Apostle Paul appears? AI Paul. <laughs> well, let's hear how you preach. And, and, and do it in English, not, not in Hebrew or Greek. But he was a man who was overwhelmed by the idea that grace had come to him. My dear friend, what a lesson that is. that you preach the gospel to yourself every day, every morning when you wake up, and you remind yourself, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, look to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. And then he adds, according as God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. Now, what does he mean? What does he mean by faith? According as God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. Does he mean justifying faith? I don't think so. Because that's, that's the same in everybody. The faith that justifies you is the same as the faith that justifies me. We are not justified on the quantity of our faith or the quality of our faith. What justifies is that our faith is in Christ and in him alone. I think he's talking about gifts. I think the logic of what Paul is saying is that he's preparing himself and and he's preparing his readers for the list of gifts that he's about to give in verses 6 through 8. God has doled out different gifts to different people. There are diversities of gifts, but there is one spirit. Think of Ephesians 4, which says the same thing. Interesting, isn't it, that Paul has to repeat himself And say almost exactly the same thing when he writes to Ephesus as when he writes to Rome. Because the same problem exists. Whenever you talk about gifts, the same problem exists. You remember in Ephesians 4, there's a list list of gifts. And then he adds, there is one body and one spirit and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all. To every one of us is given grace according to the measure 
of the gift of Christ. Well, it's the same thing here in Romans chapter 12. The point is that when you realize the nature of grace, it determines how you think about yourself. And you think of, about yourself not too highly. You think about yourself not with conceit. And we've just heard the citation of Philippians chapter 2, that extraordinary Christological poem that Paul employs, often referred to as Carmen Christi, the song of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself. Older translations didn't want to translate that word literally, emptied. And they used a euphemism, made himself nothing. But the verb that Paul employs is to empty. It's the verb that you would use to take a pail of a bucket of water and to empty it. Now, if you ask the question, of what did Christ empty himself? If you begin to answer that question, you're in the realm of heresy. Because he didn't empty himself by subtraction. He emptied himself by addition. He became something that he never was. A frail, mortal human being. He humbled himself. He didn't stand upon the dignity of his deity and say, I, I will not become incarnate. But at the same time that he is God, he is also equally a human being, a little frail infant, totally dependent upon his mother lying in a manger in Bethlehem. One who wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. One who fell asleep in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. One who when you pricked him, he bled. One who was capable of dying on a cross on a Roman gibbet. Now, pride, that's the first thing. But secondly, we are one body in Christ with many different parts. Verses four and five, we are one body, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, the church is the body of Christ. That's a Pauline phrase. And it's a Pauline phrase that he uses in three of his epistles, the body of Christ. There are other metaphors. The church as a building, or the church as a family, or the church as an empire. But here he wants to employ the simile that the church is like a body. When we have prima donnas in the church, well, after 45 years of ministry, I've met prima donnas in the church. And they're loud. And they're always drawing attention to their gifts and to themselves. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, where he uses this metaphor again, he points out that the body has one head. The head is the reasoning aspect of the body. The head is the controlling aspect of the body. It's not your finger that tells you to lift up your left foot. It is your brain. It is your head. Now, that's the extent of my understanding of the human body. (laughs) I haven't studied medicine. I don't have a degree in medicine. But I think all of us in here, unless we're a little bit crazy, will understand the importance of the head. If you cut your head off, nothing's going to work. (laughs) Right? You can remove a spleen. You can even amputate an arm or a leg. But if you take off your head, it is over. Here, the emphasis is is on the diversity of the many members. For as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. Just as in the body, there are many members. There are eyes and ears and hands and feet and so on. And each one has a distinctive role to play. So it is in the church. And what Paul wants to do is that before we can talk about gifts and before we can talk about people having particular gifts and different gifts and different levels of gifts, and some have one gift and others have ten gifts, before we can even go there, we need to talk about humility, we need to remember grace, but we also need to remember the unity of the one body that is the church. The unity of the body. Now, let's not get off on a tangent. People use texts like these, and especially John 17, where Jesus is praying for the unity of the church. Does that mean does that mean denominational unity? No. Denominations are inevitable. From the very beginning, it was inevitable. Take, for example, take for example the doctrine of baptism. There isn't a single text in the New Testament that says you must baptize the children of believing parents. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I am a Presbyterian. I was a Baptist, but I saw the light. (laughs) I am a diehard, convinced pedo-Baptist. But there isn't a text in the New Testament that says, you must baptize the children of believing parents. It is an inference drawn from the many, many evidences that seemed to suggest and press you into that conclusion. But I understand perfectly. If my dear friend Steve Lawson was here, he would be amening, for sure. I understand perfectly the logic of his argument. All I'm saying is that that Paul isn't talking here about denominational unity, nor do I think is Jesus speaking about denominational unity in John chapter 17. What an extraordinary variety there exists in the church. Christians aren't all the same. They don't all look the same. They don't all behave the same. When you're in a cult, they're all the same. They behave the same. They dress the same. But one of the great things about the church is diversity. But when there's diversity, you must always remember that That diversity must work for the service of the one church, the church of Christ. 
Paul isn't necessarily talking here about what we might call super gifts, gifts like that existed in apostolic times. Gifts of tongues and prophecy, for example, as he talks about them in, in, in Corinth, or gifts of preaching or leadership. But all gifts, gifts of hospitality and welcoming and befriending, as we shall see tomorrow. Every gift is important. This was such an important truth at the time of the Reformation. It was such an important truth for Luther, the doctrine of vocation. That the man or woman who sweeps the floor has a gift, and that gift can be celebrated for God. That was not true in medieval times. We are members one of another. Fellow Christians who may have greater gifts than we do are equally members of the one body. And Paul wants us to understand that. Foundational. Before he talks about the gifts themselves, as we, as we shall undoubtedly hear about tomorrow morning, we need to understand the sense of interdependency. We need each other. We need to serve each other. We need to help each other grow. We need to encourage each other to be useful. So what have we seen? That when Paul begins to think about individual gifts, do I have this gift? Do I have that gift? And when some gifts seem to be more important than other gifts, or more public than other gifts, or more demonstrable than other gifts, he wants to remind you of the grace of God, that whatever gifting we may have, it is all by grace. Because the whole of the Christian life, from beginning to end, is of grace. Paul is terribly concerned here about pride. The devil will come in. Whenever there's a talk about gifts, whenever there's a talk about stewardship, praise the Lord, I've probably given my last address on stewardship. <laughs> my, my annual address on stewardship is a thing of the past. And when you talk about stewardship, you're not just talking about money, the stewardship of wealth, but you're talking about the stewardship of time and talent and tithe. But time and talent, the stewardship of time and the stewardship of talent. Gifts that are latent. Gifts that are underutilized. When someone comes up to you and says, what is your spiritual gift? Well, my temptation is to pop them one in the nose. <laughs> because a question like that is almost guaranteed to bring a measure of pride, to draw attention to oneself. And these gifts must serve to bring about the unity, the one body the interdependency, the interrelatedness of the church of Christ. Because the church is the body of Christ, and he is the head. And there is one body. When the great Hudson Taylor, great missionary to China, and the founder of the China Inland Mission, and he was speaking one time at a Presbyterian church in Melbourne in Australia. And the moderator, it was the uh, General Assembly, and it was meeting in Melbourne of a Presbyterian denomination, and they'd invited Hudson Taylor to come and speak. And the moderator was using all kinds of grandiloquent uh, terms and introducing Hudson Taylor as the 
the, their illustrious guest. And Taylor stood on the podium quietly and said, Dear friends, I am a little servant of an illustrious master. I am a little servant of an illustrious master. So before you get told tomorrow about individual gifts, and as you begin to think about what your special gifting might be, in a proper way, in a biblical way, in a spiritual way, that we understand that we are different and God has made us different and he's gifted us in different ways. And we are aware sometimes that we do have a gift in this particular area and not in another area. I have a friend who has a gift in evangelism. And never a, a moment goes by, an opportunity goes by, and he doesn't utilize that gift. I was going through TSA checking with him one time in Jackson, Mississippi. You don't mess with TSA people, <laughs> right? You say, yes, sir, no, sir. You don't mutter under your breath. You smile the whole time. They've taken your bag. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. And uh, this TSA man said to my friend, where are you going? And he said, to heaven. <laughs> and in a matter of 10 to 15 seconds, he told him the gospel, that he was a saved man and that one day he was going to go to heaven. And that's it. That's a gift. I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the 12th chapter of Romans. We thank you for how instrumental it has been in the ministry of Ligonier, the renewing of your mind. And we ask that our minds might continually be renewed with the humility that ought to be ours and the sense that by grace we have been made one body in Christ to serve one another, and to serve you. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.